this afternoon we have uh, with us Dr. Alphonse Jansman. He is a senior scientist working on pigs and poultry at Wageningen Livestock Research in the Netherlands. Alphonse obtained his PhD from Wageningen University after defending his thesis on tannins in feedstuffs for monogastric animals. After his PhD, he was employed by the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research, also known as TNO. And then in 2003, he joined Wageningen Livestock Research. His main areas of expertise are the nutritional evaluation of feed ingredients, digestive physiology in pigs, amino acid requirements and metabolism, and nutrition and health in pigs and poultry. So today, Alphonse Jansman will be talking about nutrition and intestinal development in young piglet. Welcome, Alphonse, and it's up to you. Okay, Mathieu, thank you very much for the introduction, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to contribute here to the series of, uh, of lectures and uh, the webinar of uh, Tonicity, uh, talking this afternoon about nutrition and intestinal development in, uh, in young piglets. Uh, in my view, very important uh, topic because uh, the young piglets, uh, they undergo physiological and digestive developments which form the basis for their productivity and health in later life. Um, it's a complex uh, area, uh, however, we get more and more a better picture of um, intestinal development at early age and also we get increasingly a better grip on how to uh, manipulate this intestinal development via uh, nutrition interventions and I would like to share some thoughts with you about that in the, the lecture this afternoon. Um, the um, importance of uh, gut health and, uh, and uh, development is, uh, is, uh, is rather uh, obvious uh, because we encounter a number of issues in, uh, in practice of which we say and indicate hey, here is a situation of uh, suboptimal health of the digestive system and of the animal. And in particular, a period around weaning, uh, sometimes we encounter uh, post weaning diarrhea. Uh, so a condition in which uh, the digestive uh, process is disturbed, the intestinal microbiome is, uh, is disturbed and uh, the animal can be really suffering from this uh, condition. Uh, at the same time, it's also uh, a reason uh, to use antibiotics at the veterinary prescription. And this is something which we wanna prevent. Um, in addition to that, up to uh, now in some countries, there is still an option to use uh, zinc oxide as uh, a medication for the condition of post weaning diarrhea, but this uh, zinc oxide use will be banned in, uh, in the coming period, at least in, uh, in the EU. That means there are limited possibilities to um, uh, approach the problem from the veterinary perspective. That means we need to do more from the preventive side and nutrition is one of the means by which we think we can support intestinal health and functionality. And we can do that in, in different ways. Uh, as nutritionists, we have the possibility to manipulate diet composition in terms of ingredients, in terms of nutrients, and also in terms of uh, the, the choice of uh, feed additives. And in, an, in, a, in a complex way, they, they all can have effects on uh, the health and functionality of the gut. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples in my presentation uh, later on. And I will end up with some uh, conclusions. So just a, a, a slide to, to set the scene a little bit. Uh, this is a slide showing the reduction in antibiotic use uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands by the um, animal production uh, sector. And here you can see, um, we, this was on our agenda in the Netherlands for um, yeah, more than a decade. Uh, since uh, around 2008, 2009, there was real governmental pressure and European pressure to bring down antibiotic use in animal production. And since then, 
you can see uh, for most animal species, there was a, a significant drop in the use of antibiotics. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the line for the pigs, you can see here, um, compared to the reference year 2009, uh, the reduction was with about 60%, so very uh, substantial. Um, and um, in the category of pigs, of course, we discriminate uh, the sows, the growing pigs, and, um, and the piglets. But it appears that uh, the young piglets, and especially weaned piglets, uh, are uh, main consumers of antibiotics uh, within the pig sector. Um, however, we also have to realize that there is a, a large variation in practice among farms, and that is what is represented in the in the two uh, graphs, which you see on the on the right uh, side. Here you see uh, the distribution of antibiotic use. Uh, among uh, different farms. So you see here for the sow and piglet farms, you see uh, a fairly large proportion is, is below a certain threshold value, but there is still 10, 20% of the farms which are above a certain limit. And that means uh, in the Netherlands, they are obliged to come up and to make a plan together with their vet uh, to, to bring down antibiotic, antibiotic use in the, in the, in the future. And the same story holds for, uh, for growing pigs. Also here you see that there is uh, a certain distribution in terms of uh, percentage of uh, farms and their uh, antibiotic use. And also you see here, there is a kind of top 20 or 25% which are consuming much more antibiotics than, uh, than other farms. So it's very important to also explore what is, what is behind this, uh, this variation. And uh, that is uh, something uh, which is uh, research is, uh, is going on on this in the, in, the, in the Netherlands. But at the same time, it shows that it's also uh, possible to, to have a pig production with low consumption of antibiotics. And uh, we all think that should be the future. When we talk about uh, the functions of the, of the gut and gut health, then classically we think primarily uh, to the gut as being the site where nutrient digestion takes place. So that's represented here at the left part of this slide. And we all know we can discriminate between enzymatic digestion and fermentative digestion. Enzymatic digestion taking place by the host enzymes secreted in the lumen of the digestive tract and bring, brought into contact with the substrates which are present in the diet. And in this way, major part of the protein, uh, the starch, and uh, the fat is degraded and subsequently absorbed. And beside that, we dis discriminate the fermentative digestion. And this is the digestion taking place by the microbiome present in the gut. And especially in the hind gut, we all know that substantial fermentation can take place, which contributes to the energy supply of, uh, of the animal in the form of, um, of uh, short-chain fatty acids, which can be metabolized by the pig. However, we more and more realize that uh, the gut has more functions and the barrier function is a very important one and a complex one because different elements play an important role there. On the one hand, uh, we have the intestinal microbiome, which is part of the barrier because it can prevent, for example, that uh, pathogenic bacteria can colonize, colonize the gut and, uh, and grow out and cause uh, uh, disease. Uh, however, there is also an immunological component because the gut is, and the gut tissue is a major uh, part of the uh, immune system. There are many immune cells found in the mucosa and submucosa of the, of the gut. And there is intensive interaction between the intestinal microbiome and the local uh, immune uh, system. So when we talk about intestinal health, uh, we often talk about this uh, triangle, the interaction between the animal on the one hand, which is intestinal mucosa and local immune system. We have the intestinal microbiome and we have the diet because the diet on the one hand is serving uh, um, and, and is responsible for um, uh, the nutrient supply for productivity of the animal, but at the same time, uh, via the diet, we also feed the intestinal microbiome. And that is something uh, that, we should, uh, that we should realize. 
And secondly, we should be aware of the fact that the intestinal microbiome interacts with the local uh, immune system and with the intestinal mucosa. And this uh, transfer of, uh, of information uh, results in, in responses of the immune system and in responses of the animal towards the intestinal microbiome. It's a delicate balance between, uh, let's say, being alert in, in terms of uh, the presence of pathogenic uh, microbial species and uh, being a true symbiosis in which the intestinal microbiome contributes to the nutrients and energy supply of the animal. And this triangle is, uh, is also, um, uh, it's not a, a steady one, it's not always a very uh, predictable one because the environment in which the pig is, is housed has a major effect on, on this interaction. So in, with environments, you can think of um, uh, sanitary status on the farms, you can think of the climate, you can think of the, um, the characteristics of the far, farm in terms of size, in terms of um, uh, animal density in the pen and, and so on. So if we further uh, look into the, the gut, then uh, you can uh, look at the gut in this uh, schematic uh, presentation where you see the intestinal lumen in the top uh, part and uh, the intestinal mucosa in the lower part of this, of this diagram. In the top part, you see the intestinal lumen in which the dietary constituents from the diet pass through the GI tract. Uh, partially, the diet is degraded and nutrients are degraded by the digestive enzymes, which I just mentioned. Uh, but there is also a lot of interaction with the intestinal microbiome present in the lumen of the gut. And that is indicated here by uh, different microbial species which feed and grow on substrates being coming from the, from the diet. But you also see here that the intestinal microbiome interacts with the mucus layer and with the enterocytes which are found underneath the, um, the mucus uh, layer. And here, you can see some, uh, some contact between the intestinal microbiome and the uh, submucosa in which you find different types of immune cells. And uh, there is constant uh, sampling of uh, material and of the composition of uh, the microbiome by certain cells of the immune system. And in this way, um, uh, there is some regulation in, the, in terms of the response of the immune system to what is passing by in the, in the gut uh, lumen. Uh, there are many different uh, immune cells. They are not all represented in this uh, diagram, but you have antibody producing cells. You have uh, cells which are responsible for this uh, sampling of, uh, of antigens and pathogens like the M cells. And there are also uh, immune cells which are responsible for um, uh, removing um, uh, microbes and uh, antigens which should not be present or which are considered as detrimental for, for the animal. So this is a really a delicate balance between uh, uh, the intestinal microbiome and the local immune system and you can see here all the enterocytes which have also a main absorptive function they have the capacity to absorb the nutrients from the lumen to watch the blood circulation where, from where they can be used uh, by the animal. The intestinal microbiome is, uh, is very complex of nature and it depends very much at which location, which side of the GI tract you look in terms of its, uh, its composition. And that is represented and indicated in this slide on the, on the left side. Uh, uh, you see the microbiome composition at film level and here uh, in more specific terms, uh, so a more detailed uh, uh, profile of the intestinal uh, microbiome in terms of the relative abundance of different phyla or, or, uh, uh, or genera in, uh, in, the, in the gut. And here, when you go from the left to the right, you go from the, the stomach to the small intestine, to the large intestine, intestine and to the fetus. And you can see by the change of colors that the composition of the microbiome differs depending on the location you are looking at. Moreover, there is also variation between the part of the microbiome which is present in the lumen of the gut and what can be found attached and integ more integrated to 
and the, uh, to the mucosa of the gut. So you can see here um, a different color bars for the luminal uh, composition of the microbiome and the mucosa associated uh, one. For the jejunum, you see the same story. Uh, the microbiome which can be found in the lumen is different from the one you find attached uh, to, the, uh, to the mucosa. So it's very important when we talk about the intestinal microbiome to, to, to be specific and uh, indicate um, at which microbiome we are looking at. In terms of uh, interventions, um, quite often um, in the past at least we started uh, thinking about interventions to manipulate the intestinal microbiome via nutrition after the process of weaning. However, we realize more and more that there might also be options to, inter to intervene and to apply interventions prior to weaning. Because after birth, uh, the animals are, are born rather uh, sterile and they are easily colonized uh, by the microbiome in the environment of uh, the animal. And the environment includes the sow uh, with which the piglets have intimate contact uh, from the, from the, uh, straight after birth, uh, but also it comes from, uh, from uh, other components of the environment, being the air or, or the pen uh, or the, the housing facility in which the animal is, uh, is kept. And to further explore the options to, to manipulate microbiome composition in the pre-weaning period, we did some research uh, a couple of years ago in which we worked with so-called cesarean-derived piglets. These are piglets which are born via cesarean delivery, so not via the natural way. And these piglets were grown up um, uh, apart from the sow. So they were in the beginning hunt fat and later milk fat and uh, we provided them with two different diets uh, differing in fat composition. We compared two diets differing in, uh, in, in fat composition. On the one hand, uh, we provided animals with a combination of soy oil and palm oil, and on the other hand, we provided a diet containing uh, medium chain triglycerides, which were considered to be a, a functional fat because the medium chain fatty acids are known for their antimicrobial properties. So from that perspective, we presumed that uh, feeding this kind of uh, fat could have influence on the intestinal microbiome. And beside that, uh, we had a two association treatment, uh, as we called it. We orally associated uh, these animals, which were born again by cesarean delivery, with a simple or a complex microbiome. And the complex microbiome originated from features of an adult sow. Um, and what is depicted in this diagram is a representation of the small intestinal microbiome of piglets of these four different treatments. So the combination of the dietary treatment and the, and the oral association treatment. And the main message from this diagram is that once you feed either a different diet pre-weaning or the animals are differently associated with a certain microbiome at early age in the first days after birth. This is represented in a different microbiome, different in terms of composition, at an age of about three weeks. So this clearly indicates that um, the uh, intestinal microbiome can be manipulated by specific interventions at early age, and this has longer lasting effects on the composition of the microbiome at least up to several weeks and most likely uh, substantially longer. What does it mean? Because a change in composition as per se uh, is difficult uh, to, to interpret. Uh, for that reason, we also uh, had a look at um, gene expression of the gut mucosa. Uh, and via gene expression, uh, we can derive information on the functionality of gut tissue. So we took uh, mucosal tissue and measured the expression of genes in jejunal tissue. So from the same location as I uh, showed the uh, microbiome composition on the previous slide. And uh, I'm not going to go in all the details here, 
uh, but we evaluated um, the differences we found in gene expression in terms of um, the processes which were affected or expressed differently in the different treatments. So the gene expression was, was kind of simplified into processes related to the immune system or to, to metabolic activity or more uh, generic uh, processes. And the interesting story was that we really found differences between the experimental treatments uh, in terms of processes which were affected by these treatments. And especially you can see here um, processes related to immune system and re immune responses were different between the experimental treatment. You see the number here, this reflects to the number of processes which were uh, analyzed to be differently expressed uh, by the experimental treatment. So we did a pairwise comparison of all the treatments we did, so in total six comparisons, and you can see here that some treatments did not really differ, but some of them did, and especially immune process and functions were affected. And we digged in uh, a little further and then, well, we, we, we could identify more in detail what kind of processes were, were affected. And they are summarized here in, on this, uh, in these blocks of, uh, of text. And there you can see that uh, most of the processes identified were really related to, to, to components of the immune system. So we find effects on the inflammatory response on defense response, cellular defense response, or cytokine activities, T cell activations, indicating that these early interventions do not only affect microbiome composition, but also affect the functionality of the gut tissue. And especially for this particular intervention, which we tested here, uh, the immune system was affected. So, now shifting to uh, a slightly later phase in, in life, uh, meaning um, the process of, uh, of weaning. That is uh, nicely summarized here in this, uh, in this slide. Again, you see here the intestinal uh, tract, the intestinal lumen in the top part, and the intestinal mucosa here further down this uh, nicely uh, represented intestinal lining with the enterocytes. Well, what very important is, and I'm not going in detail here, but um, as we all know, the process of weaning is a very uh, stressful event for the animal for various reasons. First of all, there is the social uh, stress because of um, the piglets being uh, uh, taken away from their mother. Uh, so that, in, that indicates a lot of uh, stress for the, the pigs. Uh, the pigs can be transferred to another room, can be transferred uh, to other uh, groups, so there is um, a need for uh, for a new social hierarchy within the group. Um, but in a, in a major stressor is also the change of diet because they go from uh, a milk-based diet coming in, in for the major part from their mother to a solid, often a solid uh, diet with different composition. And what is represented here in this diagram nicely that we normally see a change in microbiome composition of the gut at different locations uh, uh, due to the process of weaning. And quite often we see a, a loss of bacterial diversity in the days after weaning. And this can have major uh, consequences because the loss of diversity of the microbiome could create opportunities for pathogenic species to find a place because uh, the microbiome is less stable in the period after weaning compared to the, the, the pre-weaning phase. So what we quite, quite often see here is that pathogens uh, do have the opportunity to outgrow, to synthesize and produce um, uh, toxins, which could uh, affect the functionality of the gut as being a barrier because uh, these toxins could, could have harmful effects on the, on the histology uh, of the gut. The gut can become more leaked and increased permeability is often what we see in this period together with also a drop of feed intake which is often observed after feeding that makes the system is much more sensitive to disturbances and also to what often is referred to as intestinal dysbiosis. So that means uh, from a stable situation created uh, in the period prior to weaning we go to a situation where there's a loss of stability of the intestinal microbiome 
leading to dysbiosis and quite often leading to uh, the use of, of antibiotics, which give another uh, uh, shock to the system and uh, could give rise on the one hand to recovery of the animals. But again, uh, you also see uh, sometimes negative effects of um, the antibiotic use on, on the composition of the microbiome as, uh, as such. So this is a very, very important uh, phase to, to consider. And as nutritionists, we have the task to uh, support the animal as much as we can with a smooth uh, transition uh, in terms of diet and, uh, and diet composition. And I think there is still a lot to gain there, although we have already substantial knowledge on what to do, what the do's and don'ts are uh, around this uh, period of time. One of the things uh, to remind is also the importance of uh, feed intake. This is uh, a diagram, uh, a figure of uh, the PhD thesis of Erik uh, Brownings, um, a colleague from, uh, from the Netherlands, um, which did uh, research on, on feed intake of uh, piglets uh, prior and post uh, weaning. And here you can see the importance of, um, of pre-weaning feed intake upon intake of feed after uh, weaning. Here you see three groups of uh, pigs categorized uh, as being an eater, a non-eater, or a non-fat uh, uh, group. Um, and here on the, on the y-axis you see um, the percentage of pigs of the total uh, population. And on the y-axis, you see the interval between the first uh, between weaning and the first intake of feed uh, after um, after weaning. And what you can nicely see here is that the red line represents the eaters. These are the animals which were already eating prior to weaning, so they were consuming creep feed. And this group of animals is is capable of consuming feed much earlier after weaning compared to the group which were uh, named as, uh, as, um, as non-eaters, the blue line. And then we have a third group, uh, the non-fat animals. These are the animals which are, which are uh, uh, non-fat uh, prior to, to weaning. And on average, they take even longer to get uh, started after weaning. So, very important here is once again the message to have the animals adapted to ingestion of feed intake prior to weaning because that helps to overcome uh, the, the weaning transition and stimulates the support of uh, feed intake uh, after weaning. Well, you can do a lot of interventions uh, prior to weaning. Uh, after uh, weaning, uh, you can also consider um, uh, maternal interventions, that means interventions applied at the level of the sow in the, in the uh, period prior to uh, gestation of the, of, the, of the litter. And this is um, a study we did uh, a few years ago at, at, at our institute, uh, comparing uh, similar interventions either applied at the level of the sow via the diet of the sow in the final week uh, prior to farrowing, or in the period uh, after birth of the piglets, so imposed to the piglets uh, by oral administration of, uh, of a, a dose of uh, certain functional constituents or of the, uh, as they are indicated here on the, this slide, via an oral drench once or twice per day. And the treatments were medium chain fatty acids as being kind of, um, antimicrobial functional constituents, C10 and C12 fatty acids, um, uh, which are, uh, can consider to be uh, to influential to the intestinal microbiome composition. We evaluated beta-glucans, which are known to be potentially immunomodulatory um, in, the, in the gut of, uh, of pigs. And a third group uh, provided with uh, galacto-oligosaccharides which are known to be probiotics, especially in the hindgut. So the first two interventions uh, mainly were targeting the uh, small intestine, while the collector were targeting the, the large intestine. 
and we compared the intervention at the level of the sow and at the level of the, of the piglet. And our targets in this study were, were the piglets. So we evaluated the piglets which underwent these, uh, these, uh, these treatments on day one after birth. So the subpopulation was uh, sacrificed uh, on one day after birth and another group on day uh, 31, so uh, somewhat more than four weeks after, uh, after birth. And we had a specific look at the microbiome composition in at various segments of the gut. We looked at intestinal gene expression as um, uh, a measure of intestinal functionality and also some morphological characteristics were, were measured. And here in this table, you see an overview of the response of the animals in terms of gene expression in the piglets in the small intestine the stein as affected by the treatment. So here uh, you see again uh, the interventions at the life, uh, left slide part of the slide. You see the effects in the neonatal piglets, so on day one after, uh, after, uh, after birth. And um, you see the, the maternal intervention. So the piglets from this group only got the intervention uh, via the sow, which got a diet in the final uh, week of gestation containing these functional ingredients. And what you can clearly see is that a fairly large number of genes were significantly affected uh, by the experimental treatments. These observations are missing logically because uh, this combination is not possible. We could not sacrifice the animal on on day one uh, and also apply the intervention because there was no window of opportunity, no time available to do so. But you see for, um, for uh, the animal sacrificed at day 31, they had either a neonatal, so they had these oral branches every, every day, or they were supplied with this intervention via the, via the cell. But in both cases, you see significant effects of, on, the, on the gene expression of the, of the gut. For beta glucans, it was uh, the, the same, although you see here the intervention at the level of the cell, which did not affect the intestinal functionality in the piglets on, uh, on um, uh, early, uh, in the, on day one after birth, but they did uh, when we looked uh, four weeks uh, later. And the same story, more or less, for the collector oligosaccharides. However, we saw clearly that. Uh, the maternal intervention had a major effect already on day one uh, uh, on the intestinal mucosa uh, of the small intestine of these uh, piglets. So showing that this intervention really, really has, um, uh, at the level of the sow, does have effect on the intestinal functionality of the piglets. Well, you can tell a lot more about this, but overall we found uh, clear effects on the intestinal gene expression of the, of the piglets in relation to the, the, to the treatments uh, we, uh, we supplied. And um, uh, also here, it's interesting to note that the genes which were affected were really related to tissue metabolism and again, to processes uh, related to immune system development. And these effects were um, uh, intervention specific. So if, if we see a large number of genes affected here, they were different from the ones which were uh, influenced by, for example, the uh, galacto oligosaccharide uh, administration uh, via the diet of the, of, the, of the cell. So here again, another example on what we can do in terms of manipulation of the gut microbiome and gut functionality when we consider uh, early interventions. Well, as nutritionists, I already indicated that we do have uh, quite some, some, some options to, to manipulate uh, the diet in terms of nutrients and ingredients. Well, I gave a few examples of the pre-weaning, feeding, and post-weaning, uh, we do have more options. Um, and we can uh, consider, for example, the protein sources which we uh, apply and use in, uh, in piglet diets. Uh, it's very important to consider the digestibility of the protein sources because uh, young piglets have a lim still a limited capacity uh, to uh, enzymatically digest uh, the diet. 
uh, they can handle uh, fairly uh, well digestible ingredients, but uh, the ones which, uh, which are with a lower uh, digestibility, they are more difficult to digest by these young piglets with an immature digestive uh, system. The second point is that we should also consider or have a look at potential functionality of the, of the protein sources. I will have an example uh, later on, because ingredients do not only provide nutrients, but can also contain bioactive constituents, which could be helpful in supporting gut health. Protein level in the diet and amino acid profile is another point to take uh, into account. Protein level, very important on the one hand, to take care that sufficient essential amino acids are provided covering the assumed amino acid requirements of the animals on the one hand. But overfeeding is also another good, good idea because of the fact that if we uh, provide too much protein to the diet, there is an increasing risk of protein fermentation in the gut, meaning that uh, the intestinal microbiome could um, consume uh, part of the protein in the diet as, as a substrate, and this, this could give rise to, um, to the uh, formation of, uh, of toxic compounds, which could negatively affect uh, gut flow functionality. The formation of biogenic amines is an example of uh, the result of protein fermentation, uh, which have a detrimental effects. That's the reason we are normally very critical in at the protein level in diets for young piglets. However, we can, uh, we can uh, consider more points uh, also in relation to the energy supply, especially um, the starch source of, uh, uh, which you select for the diet is, uh, is an important one. The presence of easy digestible starch can be helpful to the animal uh, to digest uh, the starch in the diet. So sometimes processed starch sources are being used rather than native ones because they are slightly more resistant to enzymatic digestion. Fiber is another important part because fiber is the principally non-enzymatically digestible uh, fraction of the carbohydrates in the, in the diet. I will show you uh, a slide on this uh, later on in my presentation. We can discriminate between different forms of uh, fiber being either fermentable or, or, or uh, less fermentable. So this is a point of consideration. Of course, we should consider uh, also the use of feed additives. We all know there is a, a wide choice among different feed additives and some of them do interfere with either the digestive process or with intestinal uh, microbiome or intestinal uh, development, pre and probiotics uh, mainly uh, meant to, to steer the intestinal microbiome in a desired direction. Enzymes can be helpful to digest nutrients and organic acids create a climate in which, uh, which can be favorable um, for the intestinal uh, microbiome. Diet form structure is, is not something else because uh, via technological processing, we can um, uh, change uh, the coarseness of the diet, which could affect the behavior and passage of digestion through the GI tract. Uh, we can think of the, 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 the pellet size, for example, which could affect the feed intake. And a final point, of course, in bigger diet is the palatability. Um, the diet should be tasteful in order to stimulate uh, feed intake, uh, which is uh, important, especially in the in the post weaning phase as I illustrated on, um, on one of the, the previous slides. So digging in a little bit deeper on the protein sources, uh, well, again, uh, what I just said, a high protein content and high digest digestibility is, is important because the digestive system is not yet mature. Uh, so that's the reason we quite often use highly digestible protein sources. And I mentioned a couple of them here, whey protein, soya concentrate, potato protein, uh, important protein source in some parts of the world, and, and then fish meal. If we go to the plant protein sources, uh, then um, it is important also to consider so-called the presence or potentially presence of anti-nutritional factors. These are factors in the ingredients which would limit or restrict the digestive process. Um, 
so uh, uh, examples are uh, trypsin inhibitors present in uh, in in soya and in legume seeds, for for example, or uh, or tannins, which also limit um, the digestibility on the one hand and could have a negative effect on feed intake. On the other hand, because uh, they might also be less uh, palatable. Well, uh, what I just said is that balanced amino acid profile is 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 important uh, because on the one hand we should uh, take care of uh, matching uh, and meeting the amino acid requirements of the of the piglets. We do have the availability over uh, an increasing number of free amino acids, which can be used to balance amino acid profile in the diet. And uh, that's what we normally do. And this can be a helpful approach to bring down the protein level in the diet uh, so we can uh, limit the risk for protein fermentation and also limit the risk for, uh, um, yeah, uh, the, the, the fermentation of this non-digestible protein part in the more distal parts of the, of the GI tract. And then, of course, what I just uh, said, uh, we should not only consider the amino acid value of the protein sources, but we should also consider uh, the functional properties of uh, protein sources and feed ingredients more in general. And um, with that, I mean that we have to be aware that uh, protein sources might contain uh, bioactive uh, compounds or proteins which have uh, specific uh, characteristics. Uh, a well-known example is uh, that, for example, plasma proteins contain antimicrobial uh, properties which could be beneficial to the pig and to uh, stabilizing the intestinal microbiome. Um, a few years ago with a PhD student, uh, Sumia Kar, uh, we developed a kind of uh, uh, tool and analysis to characterize biofunctionality of protein sources. I'm not going in the details of this uh, procedure, but basically what we did is we took a number of, um, of protein sources from casein to whey protein, plasma protein, soybean meal, wheat gluten meal, and yellow meal warm as, a, as an example of uh, insect protein. And by doing uh, proteomics analysis, we could characterize certain features of the protein sources and their hydrolysates um, during the process of digestion of these individual protein sources. So we looked at the peptides and proteins released during the process of digestion. And by using information and in all kinds of databases, um, <clears throat> we were able to uh, get information on the release of proteins and peptides with certain characteristics which we grouped according to a color in these diagrams, and we put a name to these categories. And as you can see here, there is a group of proteins, peptides, which have antibacterial properties represented here by the green bars. We have some which have antioxidative properties represented here by these light blue bars. There is also a large category of ACE inhibition, and that means that the uh, proteins released during uh, digestion have uh, features in relation to regulation of blood pressure in humans because of the fact there are data used from databases coming from the human domain we get a lot of uh, feedback from these databases in relation to this uh, aspect of uh, of uh, ACE inhibition which relates to blood pressure uh, regulation it might not be so relevant for, for, uh, for pigs, but um, um, this is a result of using uh, databases uh, from, the, from the human domain. So this is just to show you that uh, we should not consider uh, protein sources only from the perspective of nutritional value, but we should also have a look at them. And uh, we may need more details on other features of these uh, protein sources which could be helpful to support intestinal health. 
Well, a more practical trial we did uh, uh, a few years ago. My, my colleague, uh, Paul Bicker, he evaluated the effect of plasma protein as being as an example of a functional protein source in diets for post-weaning piglets. Uh, this trial was done um, in, uh, in a setting of, uh, of measuring production performance. And we used different uh, experimental treatments with different inclusion levels of plasma protein uh, over different uh, time periods, the first two weeks after weaning, either or not in combination with continuing the um, uh, dietary interventions over a longer period of time and even up to five weeks. Um, and here you see um, some results regarding the zootechnical performance. And what you uh, clearly uh, see here, uh, we used uh, one treatment with zinc oxide over two weeks as, an, uh, as a reference uh, treatment. Um, and you can see here, this reference treatment really resulted in an improved body weight gain and, and, and higher uh, feed intake and also a slight improvement of the, of the feed conversion uh, ratio over two weeks and also over a longer period of time. But here you see that uh, the use of plasma protein uh, also had a positive effect on uh, on um, on uh, on feed intake, uh, for example, but also on uh, body weight uh, gain. If you compare treatment three with the reference treatment treatment uh, one, uh, maybe not as high as compared to the zinc oxide uh, treatment, but uh, it was uh, significant for for some of the treatments. Well, the same observation and picture over the first of the uh, five weeks uh, of which the experimental period uh, consisted. Um, well, I'm not going here into the, all the details regarding all this uh, experimental treatment with plasma, but you can play a bit with uh, the period of time and this could, could have effect on, on, on the final results in terms of these old technical performance. Uh, but maybe also in terms of, uh, yeah, what does it do at the level of the, of the features? So we measured quite frequently the fecal score. So whether or not we find normal features or soft features or uh, signs of diarrhea, of, uh, of occurrence of a watery diarrhea. And here you could clearly see that there were significant effects of the treatments. Again, we saw a positive effect of using the zinc oxide in, and uh, the treatments with the plasma proteins uh, had a response which was uh, for most treatments somewhere in between uh, the positive and the negative control. This is uh, clearly showing that um, um, yeah, some protein sources not only have only uh, nutritional value, but could have functional value in terms of uh, uh, stabilizing uh, gastrointestinal conditions and providing support to, uh, to, to gut health. And this could, for example, be related to the presence of antimicrobial uh, uh, peptides and proteins and antibodies in this functional uh, uh, ingredient. Then shifting to the uh, non-starch polysaccharides, the dietary fiber in the, in the diet, um, we should realize that uh, normally we distinct, distinct the fiber from the starch and the sugars, where the starch and sugars generally are, are digestible to a reasonable extent or, or to a large extent. But the non-starch polysaccharides, they are really very different in, in nature in terms of chemical composition. Um, but also they show variation in functional properties. And with functional properties, uh, we could think of things like uh, water holding capacity, swelling capacity, viscosity, and solubility. And it should be uh, considered that this is uh, these are important char characteristics in relation to the um, digest our passage through the GI tract and in turn this could also have consequences for the provision of substrates for the intestinal microbiome in different segments of the GI tract because um, uh, non-starch polysaccharides can be fermented to a certain extent in uh, the hindgut and for some non-starch polysaccharide fractions that can already be uh, some fermentation in the small intestine. Um, so it is very important to realize uh, what could be the location and the extent of fermentation 
uh, of uh, NSP in, in feed ingredients and in the diet for, uh, for piglets and also for, uh, for growing pigs. And we should also realize that uh, some of these non-starch polysaccharide fraction could have prebiotic value in terms of uh, steering and manipulation of the intestinal microbiome because some especially soluble parts of parts of the soluble fraction of non-starch polysaccharides can be uh, fermented can be used as energy source uh, by a certain part of the intestinal microbiome and this could help to steer the um, intestinal microbiome well, how does it, could it work in practice? This is a kind of summary slide of a number of experiments which were performed uh, by, by, by Kim et al. using uh, uh, a challenge trial with uh, enterogenic E. coli, the ETEC, uh, using diets with a different carbohydrate composition uh, going from highly digestible uh, carbohydrate and starch sources like cooked rice up to uh, a wheat-based diet, extruded wheat-based diet, so having uh, a lot of gelatinized starch in included, up to uh, uh, diets with barley, either or not enzyme supplemented, up to carbohydrates which uh, do not have nutritional value as such, which, which change, uh, for example, the viscosity and passage rate of intestinal digestion. And what you clearly see is on the x-axis, you see the the concentration of soluble non-starch polysaccharides in the diet. And from this uh, overall picture, we can derive that the extent of uh, presence of soluble non-starch polysaccharides has an influence on um, uh, the capacity of uh, ETEC, so hemolytic ETEC, so the pathogenic E. coli, to colonize in the small intestine and, and, and and create conditions which are uh, related to post-weaning uh, diary. Um, so especially also the soluble NSP fraction is, is a fraction to be considered uh, in diets for young uh, piglets. Uh, we have possibilities to manipulate this fraction to some extent by processing of the feed or the ingredients, or by, for example, taking into the Form, formulation uh, specific enzymes targeted to break down uh, the, the, this soluble non-starch polysaccharide uh, fraction. So then, uh, as another as an example of a of a class of uh, of feed additives, we we know uh, there are certain uh, targeted probiotics which can be included in the diet. These probiotics. They uh, mainly have uh, effects in relation to the uh, stability of the intestinal microbiome. Um, so when we feed probiotics via the diet, uh, they take position in the, in the microbiome, in the, in the gut, and can be helpful to stabilize the intestinal microbiome and thereby uh, preventing the outgrowth of, um, of uh, pathogenic uh, species uh, they can be helpful in, 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 in uh, contributing to the competitive uh, inhibition of, uh, of pathogens, or they can outcompete certain pathogens or prevent that they attach to the intestinal mucosa. They can create conditions in which some unfavorable uh, microbial species cannot con colonize. Um, so the mode of action of these probiotics uh, is quite often uh, rather uh, complicated but it is an interesting uh, approach to uh, support uh, gut health of, uh, of piglets. So then I come to the conclusions of my, my presentation. I think uh, I showed that the digestive system is an, is an organ and system with a variety of functions and with great complexity end to end, especially also great dynamics in time. So going from birth to weaning to, uh, well, uh, studying it at, uh, at later age, you see large differences. And I also showed, I think, that diet composition at different time points, both in terms of ingredients, nutrients, and additives influence the microbiome composition and also the development of function of the gut, uh, including the local immune system. A specific point of attention is that uh, I think we should pay more attention to the other functional properties of feed ingredients apart of the ones which 
directly relates to uh, nutritional value because uh, I think uh, some of these properties can be helpful in the support and promotion of gut health. And I think we should uh, uh, develop procedures in which we can take into account these effects of functional properties in uh, diet formulation. And further optimization of, of the diet and nutrition for pigs, considering the various aspects of, uh, of gut function, really can help to further improve uh, gut health and, uh, of course, also to help to reduce the use of antibiotics. Having said that, I want to thank you for your uh, attention and uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Alphonse. Uh, before we move to the questions, see if you could please just move to the next slide. Uh, so tomorrow morning, I will have the pleasure to present some early intervention solution for improved life performance of pigs. So that's tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. on the Eurotier platform. And please, next slide. You have here the full program. So. Uh, another presentation tomorrow afternoon by my colleagues Eva and Stefan. So we have a few questions. We try to not make it too long because it's already one hour uh, in this webinar. Uh, so Alphonse, you addressed the point of the importance of pre-winning dietary intervention in relation to the gut development. So this is also a subject that uh, Tonicity is actively working on and uh, we will discuss this tomorrow in those two presentations. But I am asking yourself, what is your opinion? Uh, do you see options to implement such interventions in practical conditions? Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Mathieu. Uh, indeed, um, this is an important point to, to consider because uh, uh, feed intake can be steered rather well uh, post weaning. And uh, pre-weaning, uh, I think we have some options, but uh, technically it's, uh, it's slightly more difficult. Uh, first of all, we can think about uh, further developing the concept of, uh, of creep feed, which is already well known, but we also know that there is a lot of variation in creep feed intake in between animals, among animals within the, the same litter. Um, so this is something to, to explore. How can we stimulate uh, creep feed intake in all piglets in a, in, a, in a litter? And that comes in part also to um, uh, providing a creep feed diet in a form which is very palatable uh, for uh, the animal. Uh, so we should think about forms. It can be either solid or liquid that we help uh, to, to ease the uh, accessibility of the diet for these pictures. So it should be very attractive and that should help to um, uh, stimulate the feed intake of these uh, creep feeds uh, prior to, um, to, uh, to weaning. The second point is also the timing of uh, the start of this uh, creep feed uh, ingestion because uh, I showed you the, the great uh, dynamics in the in development of the gut. That is also something to, to, um, to further explore. Uh, so maybe we have to think about also some, some other kind of intervention very early after uh, births to, to help to colonize the gut in, a, in an efficient way and whether or not that should go via the diet or via other approaches where we, we have a more kind of um, intervention, manual intervention or via oral drench uh, providing some some substrate for the intestinal microbiome. That is something to be um, to be to be explored in more uh, in more detail in the future. Okay, thank you. I think we we have some solutions that we will discuss tomorrow. This is not the subject of today, but if you would like to hear more, please join our presentations tomorrow. So the second question, uh, one of your conclusion uh, is that uh, um, raw materials or feed ingredients have uh, functional properties. Uh, in practice, how can this become a part of the feed formulation? Um, yeah, that's another um, good point uh, because um, uh, right now, basically, if we, if we see limitations or we, we want a certain ingredients uh, to be part of the formula, of course, that's based on, uh, on, on price of the ingredient on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, let's say quite often we use minimum or maximum constraints 
for ingredient uh, inclusion. Um, it would be better, however, if we could um, uh, quantify these functional properties in a way that they can be included in, uh, in feed formulation so that we put values to functional properties and characteristics of feed ingredients. For example, if we uh, would be able to uh, characterize the, the prebiotic value of feed ingredients, we could uh, include that in, in diet formulation and, for example, uh, put a minimum value for uh, prebiotic activity uh, of the diet uh, coming from, from different ingredients which could potentially provide this, uh, this prebiotic uh, activity. In the same way, uh, we could think of, uh, and we did that already uh, um, a few years ago, that um, uh, some ingredients have immune stimulating capacity. Um, so how to uh, how to, uh, for example, apply a, a certain immune competence score for, for individual ingredients and put a constraint for that on the diet rather than a constraint for a particular ingredient. Well, these are concepts which need to be developed and, uh, and uh, become a little bit more mature. But I think in the near future, uh, we will not only consider uh, nutritional value, but we will uh, consider in more detail uh, the this uh, this functional values. Okay, thank you. Um, there are today new ingredients, alternative ingredients, maybe which are also more sustainable. So, for example, insect uh, protein from insects. Somebody was asking about uh, black soldier fly, for example. Um, what do you think about those ingredients? Do they have functional properties also? Can they become more important in terms of feed formulation? Um, I would say uh, uh, yes, I think um, uh, many ingredients, including the ones we are, we are commonly, uh, commonly using already, but also the, the new ingredients, uh, like the ones you, you mentioned, do contain uh, constituents with very specific properties. Uh, if you talk about the, uh, the insect proteins, they contain, for example, uh, uh, complex carbohydrates like the, 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 the chitin uh, fraction of, uh, of insects. We do not know uh, a lot but, uh, about that yet, but there are indications that they could also play uh, a role in either uh, manipulating uh, the microbiome composition or uh, some of them can also have uh, direct effects to the uh, on the intestinal uh, mucosa. So um, then they could serve what we yeah as a, as a kind of um, uh, stimulator, for example, of the uh, immune system uh, development. And the same holds true for um, uh, protein sources of uh, like like algae and seaweeds. Also, a number of uh, antioxidant and antiviral prebiotic properties have been identified already and um, and some studies uh, clearly show that that there is more than only uh, nutritional value so i'm uh, i'm really, really sure that, that 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 there is more in such ingredients than we commonly know but we have to uh, let's say uh, make this value uh, work and in the end um, it it could also be uh, a factor which uh, which uh, which will finally uh, uh, pay off because some of these novel ingredients are still relatively expensive. But if we know exactly uh, when to use them and how to use them, uh, they could be helpful also in, in supporting animal health. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think it's not a question; it's more a comment from the audience. But I just mentioned it. Somebody was talking about the role of uh, microfold cells, so the so-called M cells, which are specialized cells in the intestine that will sample or will phagocytose microorganisms or other in antigens, transport them across the epithelial surface, and then uh, that will be used by the organism to, to fight this antigen or this microorganism. I don't know if you want to add something. It was just a comment, I believe. Yeah, that, that, that's a question for me, or do you ask? No, it was, it was not a question. It was just um, somebody mentioning this. So mm -hmm. this is one of, one of the function of the, one, one of the specific cells of the intestine. 
One last question. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the diet form, the diet structure, and somebody was asking about pellet size and hardness. Can you explain more? Yeah. Um, we know that uh, that um, that pellet size and 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 structure, pellet hardness, can affect uh, feed intake, especially in uh, in in young piglets. So on the one hand, for sure, we know that the pellet should not be uh, too hard because that is um, then the piglets are have more difficulty to to handle that and to to ingest that. Uh, that. Uh, pellet uh, size is also uh, is also uh, uh, interesting. Um, interesting uh, point because uh, we have seen in research that uh, piglets are able to to ingest rather relatively large uh, pellets uh, uh, that's not a not a real problem so i would say the palatability and the hardness are are are, um, are key uh, parameters and uh, um, the diets should not uh, or two fine diets might also be not so desired because uh, um, a very high passage rate uh, could also um, be detrimental for the digestive uh, process. So some structure in the diet which uh, is causing some delay of passage um, could also be uh, uh, useful. So it's a, a complicated uh, story uh, here, uh, but it is a point of, uh, of consideration, clearly. Okay, thank you. And uh, this morning, this was also addressed by uh, Richard Ducatel, uh, who mentioned about the importance of uh, the fines and uh, the possibility of having alteration of the of the digestive tract when you have too much fines in the feed. Mm -hmm. So, okay, thank you. Uh, I don't have any more questions, so we will close this webinar and we would like to thank you again, Alphonse, for this presentation today. And as I said earlier, for those who are interested, we have two more presentations tomorrow. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all.